Pastor Chris has been doing a great job at teaching us about some of the heroes of the faith the last few weeks. We can give her a hand. Some of the amazing people who God used to bring about change in the earth. And we're going to wrap up our series today. And if you missed the previous messages, you can go on our social feeds and catch up on those. I encourage you to do that. The hero that we're talking about this morning prayed an audacious prayer. It was a prayer that, if answered, it would free the nation of Israel from tyranny and oppression. It was a prayer that, if answered, it would completely take out the chiefs of staff, the department heads, and senior advisors, basically the entire top tier of the organizational structure of their greatest adversary, the Philistines. And it was a prayer that, if answered, it would tragically end his own life. The thing about heroes, and specifically this hero, is that he had flaws. He wasn't perfect. But God still used him to change the course of a nation and bring deliverance to his people. And that gives us hope today. Because most of us are far from perfect. I don't think anyone in the room is perfect this morning. And if you think you are perfect, there's your flaw right there. Smile at your neighbor and says, you're not perfect but I love you anyway. Maybe you've guessed this morning who our hero is. Do we have any guesses? There we go. Samson is our hero. We're going to talk about a guy named Samson. And if you ever read the Old Testament, you've probably come across a little book called Judges. It's a disturbing and violent tale of how Israel basically rejects God and they become no different than any other nation. So after Joshua died, they found themselves in a destructive cycle. Israel would sin. God would let them be captured by their enemies. Israel would repent. God would send a deliverer or a judge to bring them freedom. And these judges did not merely oversee legal matters as we would know the role of a judge. Their roles often included military and administrative authority. And some would say that the judge Samson was by far the worst. He was the last of the judges, but he was the worst. He was promiscuous, he was arrogant, He was violent. Not really characteristics we would think of if we were to choose someone to lead God's people, right? We would think God would choose someone who prayed all the time and who loved everybody, who always wore their mask. (laughs) Okay, I'll leave it alone. Pastor Chris will be back next week, so there's hope. (laughs) <laughs> By the way, the judges that came before Samson, they weren't really that great either. Their track records weren't very good. The book of Judges is full of idolatry, ruthless violence, sexual sin, and even child sacrifice. It's not for the faint of heart. So the, the story of Samson begins in Judges chapter 13. And we're going to pray before we get into this. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that changes us, that gives us a glimpse into who you are, that gives us a glimpse of your heart for your people and for your love for everyone, how you want everyone to come to know you. And so we pray today, God, that this message would be a blessing to your people, that people would draw closer to you. And we would hear your voice speaking to us this morning 
that even though we are far from perfect, you still want us, you still want to use us for your kingdom. What you want to do here in the earth. Give us listening ears and listening hearts this morning. In Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. 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 Judges chapter 13. We're going to read verses 1 through 5. Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, so the Lord handed them over to the Philistines, who oppressed them for 40 years. In those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah, or Zorah, you choose. His wife was unable to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. Somebody say, be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut. For he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel. Somebody say rescue. From the Philistines. So what's a Nazarite? I'm glad you asked this morning. Nazarite is a person who takes an oath not to drink alcohol, to not eat certain foods, and not to cut their hair, okay? Verse 24. When her son was born, she named him Samson, and the Lord blessed him as he grew up, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. What does that mean, stir him? Samson's heart began to beat with God's heart for his people. Samson's will became aligned with God for his people. And while while God appointed many judges, there were 12 altogether, I believe, Samson is the only one who says God stirred his heart. Out of all 12, Samson's the only one. And maybe God has stirred you in the past. Maybe he's given you a passion for missions. Maybe he's given you a passion for the poor or for social justice. God can stir your heart but you need to take action. Last week, Pastor Chris talked about heroes needing to be prepared. And sometimes we look at our heroes, whoever your hero may be, and you wish, they had, you, wish you had their success, their accolades, you know, the stuff that you see on the outside. We want the accolades, but often we're not disciplined enough to put the time in to get there. Am I right? Mark Shifley didn't wake up one day when he was 18 years old and said, you know what, today I think I'm going to be a top-line center in the NHL. It does not happen that way. God can do miracles. He can do whatever he wants. But for most of us, it's not going to happen that way. We have to put the time in, be disciplined. Samson probably started working out at the gym. He probably started the first mixed martial arts studio. He began to train himself. His future was promising. The angel told his mom, he is going to deliver Israel. Wow! Huge calling on his life. But he had a major downfall. And that downfall was his pride. Somebody say pride. If we're honest, many of us this morning would admit that we battle pride from time to time. Anyone? Just me? Okay. See, your pride stopped you from admitting that. We're, uh, we're going to look at three characteristics of pride this morning, and hopefully these will help us. These examples will help us from from Samson's life 
be the hero that God wants us to be, all right? Let's take a look at number one, the first characteristic of pride, and that is pride doesn't accept advice. Judges chapter 14, verses one through three say this. One day, when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Get her for me. His father and mother objected. Isn't there even one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites you could marry, they asked? Why must you go to the pagan Philistines to find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She looks good to me. Doesn't Samson sound like a spoiled brat? Samson's parents are trying to help him out here. Give him some advice. And he's totally rejecting them. And that's the thing about pride. It refuses help. There has to be a level of humility to accept help, right? Now that we have navigation in our vehicles, it's a little easier, but before navigation, let me pick on the guys for a minute. We found it hard to admit that we needed help with directions, right? Yeah, I'll just look down here, okay? Because to stop and, action, stop and ask for directions would be to admit we had no clue where we were going. So, we would drive around and around and around until we finally found our destination, or we'd stop at the nearest gas station and ask for help, right? That's what we did. Samson's pride didn't allow him to ask or accept advice. And this isn't the only encounter he has with Philistine women. Samson later on goes and spends a night with a prostitute and then later on falls in love with another Philistine named Delilah. Come on, man. You're supposed to be the leader of Israel. You've been chosen by God to deliver his people and you're doing this? In Proverbs 12, verse 15, it says this. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man listens to advice. And because he rejected his parents' advice, it ultimately led to his death. Number two, pride loves to be recognized. Another time later on, Samson was actually betrayed by his own people the Israelites, and you know you have issues when your own people sort of say, here he is, you know. They tied him up and offered him to the Philistines. Judges 15, start, start at four, verse 14. And Samson arrived at Lehi, the Philistines came out shouting in triumph, but the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson, and he snapped the ropes on his arms as if they were burnt strands of flax, and they fell from his wrists. Then he found, this is, this is great, then he found the jawbone of a recently killed donkey. He picked it up and killed 1,000 Philistines with it. <laughs> a thousand. By himself. Then Samson said, okay, here's, here's his pride coming out. Then Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've piled them in heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I've killed a thousand men. When he finished his boasting, he threw away the jawbone, and the place was named Jawbone Hill. That's amazing, Samson. You the man. You win the most outstanding player. You did it. But you didn't even stop to thank God for giving you that strength. It was all about you. And that's the thing. Pride loves to be recognized. Does anyone know anyone who likes to talk about themselves? It's all about me, I did this, I did that, I, I, I. 
It gets pretty old after a while, right? I met one of my heroes in 2006. His name was Marvin McQuitty, and he lived in Houston, Texas. And Marvin was a drummer who played with gospel artists such as Fred Hammond and Mary Mary and Kirk Franklin. He also played with some secular artists. Maybe you've heard of Stevie Wonder, Jessica Simpson, Destiny's Child. And at, at the time, Chris and I had a DVD. Remember DVDs? We had a DVD of Fred Hammond as a live performance, and Marvin was drumming on it, and we would watch that thing every day and just be memorized by this guy. And I remember one day, I, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to reach out to this guy. I went to his website, and I emailed him. I said, would you ever consider coming to Winnipeg and doing a clinic with our musicians? And I, to be honest, I didn't really expect a, a reply back. The next day, I get a reply. I would love to come to Winnipeg. He didn't even know where Winnipeg was. <laughs> I would love to come to Winnipeg. And so it just worked out that he was in Toronto playing a drum clinic for Yamaha Drums. He was sponsored and endorsed by Yamaha. He was in Toronto doing a showcase. On his way back to Houston, he would stop in Winnipeg for a couple days, and we'd, you know, do some drum clinics, and he'd play at church, and so we set it all up. And the day I was going to pick him up from the airport, I, I had butterflies. I could barely drive. I was just like... Oh my gosh, my hero is coming. I'm going to see him in like 10 minutes, and he's going to be sitting in my car, and we're going to go to the keg for lunch, and I'm going to be sitting across from him. And I was just like beside myself. So when we finally met, we first met in person, and, you know, I'm taking his luggage like a good servant, you know, I'm taking his luggage. And I thought, surely he's going to start telling me about him. You know, surely he's going to talk about who he's played with and who he's been rubbing shoulders with and hanging out with and then start dropping some names. And he floored me. All he wanted to do was talk about me. He wanted to know about my family. He wanted to know about my church. He wanted to know about my dreams and it wasn't about him. It was about me. And he was my hero, but he also turned into a good friend and a good mentor. We developed a great friendship. He passed away in 2012 after a five-year battle with myelofibrosis. And his musicianship was amazing, but his heart and his gentle spirit and his humility was what affected me most. If anyone had a right to talk about themselves, it would have been him. But he didn't. Paul said in Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, he said this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Here's the third thing about pride. Pride thrives on selfish motives. Later on in the story, we already mentioned Delilah. He falls in love with Delilah, and by now the Philistines are desperate to get rid of this guy. Like He's been creating havoc among them. And so the Philistines go to Delilah and they offer her 1,100 pieces of silver if she can just get him tied up so they can capture him, okay? We'll give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah says, tell me the secret of your strength, Samson. Just tell me. And he says, okay, if you tie me up with seven new bowstrings, I will be as weak as any other man. So they're sitting there one night, they're watching Netflix, Samson falls asleep, 
and she finds seven bowstrings and ties them up. And she calls in the, the army and says, here he is, he's sleeping. Samson, wake up, they're here to capture you. And Samson just breaks out of the bowstrings like nothing. And she's like annoyed. You lied to me, come on. You know, why did you tell me that? And Samson, well, you know, he's playing with you. Tell me the secret of your strength, Samson. Okay, here's the real secret. If you tie me up with new ropes, so we're assuming ropes are a little bigger than bowstrings, okay? That should do the trick. So again, the same thing happens. He falls asleep. She ties him up with new ropes. Army comes in. He snaps him out, snaps out of it, and now she's really annoyed. Tell me the secret of your strength. Okay, if you tie my hair, remember he's a Nazarite. He's never cut his hair. We can just imagine, I don't know how long it would be, but it would be long if he's never cut it in his life. Weave my hair into a loom, a weaver's loom to make fabric, and I'll be as weak as any other man. So, same thing happens. Falls asleep. She weaves his hair into the loom. Calls the army. They come in. He busts out of it, just like the other times before. And now, she's like crying. Samson! Don't you love me? I thought you loved me. You're lying to me all the time. What is the secret of your strength? So he finally tells her, if you cut my hair, I'll be just like any other man. So that's what he does, or she does. So this time it's different. It's different. The army comes in. He has no strength. They take him, and they actually cut out his eyes. It's terrible. And they put him to work in a, in a mill, grinding grain. Time passes, and the Philistines are having a party. They're celebrating their god, Dagon. They're just, there are thousands of people there, including the brass of the Philistines, okay? All the people who make the decisions, all the people who it's above your pay grade, they, they make those kind of decisions. So they say, let's bring out Samson so we can make fun of him. And you know, thank God for him, his capture. And so they do this. And in Judges 16, we'll start reading at verse 26. Samson said to the young servant who was leading him by the hand, place my hands against the pillars that hold up the temple. I want to rest against them. Now the temple was completely filled with people. All the Philistine rulers were there. There were about 3,000 men and women on the roof who were watching Samson as he amused them. So let's just say there were 500 rulers plus the 3,000 on the roof. That's 3,500 people, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You had me worried there for a minute. It's like, I'm not that bad at math. So 3,500 people, this room can hold, if it was full, all the chairs were out, it can hold around 350. So a room, approximately 10 times the size of this, okay? So Samson continues, he prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me again. This is his prayer we talked about at the beginning. Sovereign Lord, remember me again. Oh God, please strengthen me just one more time. With one blow, let me pay back the Philistines for the loss of my two eyes. It's interesting. Even in his prayer, his selfish pride shows up interesting. It wasn't, oh God, please strengthen me so I can 
deliver your people so they can finally be free from these guys. It wasn't, oh God, strengthen me so the Philistines will see that you are the one true God and they'll turn away from their idols and stop fo- start following you. It wasn't that. It was, let me pay them back for taking my eyes. Again, always thinking of me. Verse 29, then Samson put his hands on the two center pillars that held up the temple. Pushing against them with both hands, he prayed, let me die with the Philistines. And the temple crashed down on the Philistine rulers and all the people. So he killed more people when he died than he had during his entire lifetime. You can say, wow. Some people are skeptical at stories like this one. It didn't really happen. It's just a story that somebody made up sometime. And you know, the the pillars are just a metaphor for the revenge that Samson wanted to have. It wasn't really physical pillars. In the 1970s, the remains of two Philistine temples were excavated around the area of modern Tel Aviv. Both had two main pillars that supported the roof. Archaeologist Amahai Mazar is a professor in the Institute of Archaeology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He discovered two column bases for a pair of central pillars supporting the roof. And Mazar said this, he said they were close enough together that a large man could reach both of them at once. Stand with me if you're able this morning. Because of his pride, Samson never reached his full potential. Could you imagine what he could have done if his life was totally surrendered to God? But he was still called, even with his flaws, he was still called by God for a purpose, a special purpose. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Chris talked about the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11, and Samson is included in that list of people in the Hall of Faith. And that's the thing about faith. Hebrews says it's impossible to please God without it. Did God endorse Samson's sin and poor decisions? No. So why did he choose a guy like Samson to lead his people? Maybe it's because God wanted to give hope to flawed, messed up people, just like you and me. And don't get offended this morning, we all have our stuff. He does that so we could rise to the challenge and be the heroes that he created us. Are we perfect? No, far from it. But God wants to use you and I to accomplish his purposes, just like he used Samson to accomplish his purpose here in the earth. And unlike Samson, let's live our lives fully surrendered, our hearts fully surrendered to God.